Hi, I'm John Stalkup. I'm uh, with Google. I work on the compiler for GWT. And I'm going to talk today about incremental compilation, and, which is something we released with 2.7. Um, it's something we continue to improve. And I'm going to talk about those continuing improvements. I'm going to talk about uh, some short-term uh, plans for the compiler in general that aren't incremental compiler related, as well as some kind of maybe little crazy long-term ideas that are kind of interesting, too. Um, uh, I think I don't have enough information to cover a whole hour, so if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me, and I'll be happy to answer. So I guess we'll get started. So um, if you were here for this talk last year, uh, it was just in the sort of the, the nascent stages of incremental compilation, and it was a library-based design, um, which I actually still prefer. I think it's a more elegant design. Um, we ended up doing something a little bit different. Um, so at the time, uh, let me back up a step. Um, uh, I'll be talking about not just uh, incremental compilation, but what it is, how we did it, and what are the performance gains. And um, for your own projects, you know, where you work, how you can take advantage of it, and then, as I mentioned, future ideas. So um, incremental compilation, in case you don't have that background, the idea is that if you have some large program, let's say you've got 20,000 classes, and you modify one class, if you modify one class, you, you hope that you don't have to recompile all 20,000 classes to get your application again. Um, if you work with Java, uh, you're very used to, you modify one class, you get one resulting class file, you relaunch your program with just that change and everything's really fast. Uh, GWT has had a problem for a long time where it was, it's not been incremental. So basically, uh, largely because it likes to do global optimizations, it loads up, uh, it reprocessed all classes. You modify one class, it reprocessed all classes. So maybe when you first started your project, uh, performance was pretty good because you only had like 500 classes or something and the cycle time was pretty quick. Uh, the larger your application and the more successful your application got, uh, the slower your iteration time and the lower your developer productivity. So that wasn't very fun. So that's where our motivation to work on incremental compilation came from. It appears every time I bump this it loses video, so I will not touch it. Um, so last year we were at a little bit of a, a difficult point. Um, dev mode browser support was going away um, any month or so at that time. Dev mode browser support is pretty much gone now, uh, pretty much across the board. Um, and I uh, presented a prototype implementation of a library-based incremental compilation. Um, but there was still a lot of unknown. It worked pretty well, but we hadn't really uh, bullet tested it uh, with customers to see what problems that they would deal with. So after the conference, we went and we worked with one of, um, let me back my step. So um, now that 2.7 is out, I, I'm sure you're already taking advantage of 2.7 incremental compilation. Performance is a lot faster, right? You're getting, um, in medium-sized applications, you're getting six, uh, uh, five to 15x performance improvements for a fully warmed up compile, which is pretty dramatic. Um, and we're even beating dev modes refresh time by about 3x in our testing. Um, and not just that, you're also not experiencing as much uh, sort of browser runtime lag. I'm sure you, you know, you're using dev mode, the browser always felt a little bit sluggish. Um, and because we're not emulating any of that behavior, it's also a little bit more accurate. Um, but, uh, but after the conference, we needed to actually take this library-based uh, incremental compile solution and, and bullet test it with a customer. So we went to one of our largest customers, and we, we were like, let's make this happen. Let's go through your build system. Let's find the problem. Let's put it in production, and let's get this performance win for people. And after two months of working with this customer, we were still not able to get them on board. And what we found was that um, when you have a compiler that's monolithic for so long, it allows certain bad practices to build up in your build file definitions. And these bad practices, we, could, we wrote automated tools to identify them and point them out, but it actually required human intervention and judgment for most of the fixes. So we could say, here's a missing dependency, but as for what's the right dependency to add, maybe there are two or three that were a possibility and there are pros and cons to each one, so we couldn't automate those solutions. So we reached a little bit of a breaking point where we, we had to, to say, We've got this fast solution, and we want to be able to roll it out to all of our customers, but even some of our most dedicated customers can't get on board because it's just so much work. Um, and what can we do to make this available to everyone? And uh, I, uh, so, you know, hard decisions. How can we roll this out to everybody? So we eventually uh, came up with a solution, and Gaktu gets the credit for this idea, that um, Basically, we can do the work incrementally, but it doesn't have to be library-based. It can still be a monolithic compile. And that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction. You're doing a monolithic compile, but you're doing the work incrementally. But the idea is that you do a monolithic compile, like the old compile, 
So you have all the information uh, accreted into one central location, and that's what allows you to get around some of these uh, dependency problems that people have missed along the way, because all the information is available centrally. But when you recompile, you maintain indexes that you'd built on the previous compile uh, that are a global picture of the world, and you just incrementally update parts of those indexes. And then you take this, what is a monolithic global index, but you only incrementally updated it, and you use this to perform the work. So that's how it's incremental, but it's incremental in the context of a global monolithic compile. Um, and interestingly, it, uh, it doesn't just allow you to get around a lot of these dependency problems. It actually runs a little bit faster. Um, when you are compiling at the library level, you're sort of artificially requiring that if I modify one class, I actually have to recompile that entire library. And maybe that library has five or six or 10 files in it. So you're actually ex uh, expanding the amount of work a little bit. Um, but with, uh, with uh, monolithic incremental compiles, we're actually incremental on the, at the class level, and you can see that in the design. So we, we've got indexes that tell us um, these classes depend on these classes, and a change here will require another change here. We detect which files have actually changed. We mark those classes as dirty, and then we know which classes reference them, and we sort of cascade to say, if this file, this class is known to be modified, I know that I probably also need to reconstruct this other class over here that references it. For example, let's say I've changed the method signature on some function. Um, that means that the way that function is called in another location is now not necessarily trustworthy. So we, we basically come up with the core set of known modified files. We cascade to sort of the victim modified files, and then we reconstruct all those, and then relink everything together. Um, it's, a, it's an effective process. Uh, we we're happy to do it because it gave us a performance gain, but sadly, it actually, it continues something that I think the GWT compiler has done a lot of that I, I'm not very happy with, which is um, it blurs the line between build system and compiler. So sort of historically, eight years ago, nine years ago, whatever it is now, when the GWT compiler started, there weren't very many um, well-defined, well-known build systems that you could plug into. There wasn't like a, a Buck or a Gradle or a Maven or those things at that time. And so um, GWT took on a lot of those responsibilities itself. And I think to some degree it did it in, um, in a way that wasn't very well structured. So for example, if, if you have generators in GWT, uh, a normal build system will v basically force you to, uh, to define all the files that are gonna be input for that generator in the, in the build system definition. And that makes it very easy for the build system to know if one of the input files for the generator has changed, I need to rerun the generator. GWT didn't go that path, so basically GWT has allowed generators over all this time to just sort of read and write whatever data they want to, and that makes it difficult to know which generators need to be rerun, because how do we know it needs to be rerun if we don't even know what files we should be tracking to see if they've changed? So we had to put a lot of hooks in place to sort of like listen in on the behavior of the generators and, and secretly record what they were reading so that we would know the generator even needs to be rerun later. Um, and that's not completely foolproof. Um, we catch it like, for all the generators that, w that we distribute, we catch it 100% of the time, but it's possible that someone's written a custom generator that does it in a way that we're not able to detect. So it, um, so far, you know, 2.7's been out for a long time, and we haven't had a single report of such a problem, which is very encouraging, but um, just an example of, it's not good to blur the line between build system and compiler, and I'm gonna go over that a little bit in the, the future ideas, and we'd like to draw that line uh, a little more clearly. We'd like to pull those build system features out and make us more of just a pure compiler that's driven by a build system. So um, now that uh, you've given a little bit of background, uh, you know, 2.7's been out for a while, we've got pretty fast incremental compilation, but it's, it's worth considering how incremental is it, because you may remember Gwitars, um, Gwitar files, I'm sure everyone remembers those a little bit. When they came out, they were advertised as a little bit of an incremental compilation solution, and it wasn't, too much of a stretch to say that, but the performance impact was only about like 1.5 to 2x is good, but it wasn't, if you think about recompiling the world versus recompiling just the changed files, if it was truly incremental, you'd get much more than a 2x uh, performance improvement. And so when I say that what we are gonna do now is incremental, that's mostly true too. Um, it's more true than Guitar saying so, but it's not completely true. So let's go over some of those details. Uh, there's a lot of different stages in, in compilation, and we've made module parsing incremental because we, uh, we reused previously uh, cached, uh, parsed results of modules. We made disk resource scanning incremental in that we reuse uh, cached versions of disk resource scans. We also use iNotify listens on the file system so we don't actually have to scan after the first time. Um, we have incremental class parsing because we have uh, uh, caching there. 
but we actually don't have incremental um, type index construction for generators. It's a very tricky uh, thing to do, and that part of the work is monolithic. And the interesting thing is when you have nine stages or so, and you take seven of them or six of them and make them incremental, the amount of work in those stages goes down really, really far, and almost all the work left in the compiler is in like the handful of monolithic stages. So it's interesting because it, it makes it very clear where the next opportunities for improvement are. Um, going forward, our application AST stitching is incremental. Our uh, regular type indexes for sort of optimization and normalization work are all, is also incremental. Um, our normalization passes are incremental. Our, our JavaScript source generation is incremental. Um, Guitar actually only incrementalized um, the class parsing, basically, because it would take the results of the class parsing and cache that to disk and reuse that later, but everything else was still monolithic, which is why it was not getting uh, as dramatic a performance improvement as it could have. So, and then uh, our last two stages, source map construction and our linking packaging stage are still monolithic. So those are three places where we still have opportunity for further improvement. Um, but we have got, um, uh, at this point, we're, we're not sure if we're even gonna do uh, continued work on those three stages because there's, there's a significant question of diminishing returns. Um, you know, we've got like a five to 15x performance improvement for most of these projects. Um, the remaining pieces that aren't monolithic uh, are the, the most complex to change? What's the, the value balance between adding new features, improving stability, and improving performance? Um, we think we're about at that balance right now. We're not completely certain. If you have feedback on that, we'd love to hear it. Um, so uh, what does the performance look like for the average? Actually, these numbers are pulled from uh, Inbox, which I think Ray was talking about earlier today. It's gonna be covered in some other, uh, other presentations, but it's basically like a medium-sized internal application. These are pretty normal numbers. Before 2.7 and before incremental compilation, in super dev mode, your first compile on a this medium sized application this size is about 45 seconds. And it was the slowest compile because it, it had to build all the caches, it had to wait for the JVM to warm up, all these really slow stages. The second compile would be faster. And then by the third compile, it sort of reached like a steady state warm, warm situation where all the caches are hot, the JVM is hot, and, and compiles are fast. So this is sort of like first compile, second compile, third compile, on and on. After the third compile, it's a steady state of about 30 seconds. Um, with incremental compilation, that steady state, when all the caches are warmed up, because we have more caches now, um, is down to three seconds. Huge performance improvement. Developers really happy about this. Uh, makes a big difference. Um, but actually, we've got some unreleased work. What you may notice here is there's still this big chunk here over on the left, right? Like, that's time you're waiting. That first compile matters, too. So we've got unreleased work in uh, basically queued up for 2.8 where we've already addressed that problem as well. Basically, we take those caches that we build, you know, that exist after things are warm, we save them to disk, and then the next time you launch super dev mode, we just reload those caches from disk. And so now you don't even have like a super slow first compile. So that's some, some improvement coming along. Um, uh, I'm sure probably everyone is already taking advantage of incremental compiles because you probably didn't have to make many changes in your system to take advantage of it. But there are some things you can do to, um, to fully take advantage of it. So one thing to be aware of is that uh, we do this tricky work of tracking you know, which files have been modified and what does that mean for which classes we need to recompile, which resources have been modified and what does that mean for which generators we need to rerun. Um, and you'll notice that certain generators are just very expensive. So when there's a generator that's very expensive to run and it also needs to rerun frequently, it, it in particular will, will uh, specifically hurt people's uh, developer experience. And GWT RPC is, is such a generator. So people write these applications and you know, they've, got a, they've got their RPC interface and they've got all these types that are, are going over the wire back and forth and all the subclasses of those types. And there's a lot of things going on there. Um, for GWT RPC to be able to do that work, it needs to have a global view of the, of the type state so it could do global type analysis and figure out what are all the types that can go across here. And then once it comes up with that list of all the types that are serializable, it also needs to rerun every time the contents of one of those types changes. So if I've got some serializable type and I add a field, GWT RPC needs to re-execute so that it can recreate serialization types for that. Um, so that actually happens pretty frequently and the cost of that happening is very high. So um, we don't have like an official stance on this, but we're sort of slowly pushing people towards alternative solutions because in a lot of ways GWT RPC as a design is too magical, it just can't scale. So if you can replace it with something like protobuf or anything along those lines where your, um, your DTOs, your, your, your data uh, objects on the wire are not POJOs, they're, um, 
they're not your normal classes, it puts you in a situation where there are fewer reasons that your generator needs to rerun. So Protobuf in particular, as an example, if you have Protobuf files that define your wire format, you only need to rerun that generator when your Protobuf files have been edited, which is much less frequently. Um, it also has a lot smaller output, and the analysis it has to do to come up with the output is a lot cheaper. So you'll find that you have a lot better developer experience, uh, I believe, with some of the alternative RPC solutions. Um, internationalization is, is another offender, and we don't really have a good solution for this. I think, you know, if you have an application that has international customers, you pretty much have to be using an internationalization solution. Um, but I think long term, we would like to move to a situation where internationalization is not a generator. It's more of, um, you have data files that describe the, the strings that you need in different, uh, different contexts, and that data file would be loaded up at runtime by your application and used dynamically rather than being part of the compile. And that will that'll have a lot of knock-on effects. So for example, there's this sort of combinatorial explosion problem with permutations right now where you have six browsers you're supporting and 40 languages, and now you've got 240 permutations of output in your production compiles, and your production compiles take like a day or something. Um, if you could pull 40 out of that, it, it'll be a lot faster. Um, so another thing, and this is actually something I've, I've uh, through the user forums, uh, warned a couple people in the community about. Um, if you have custom generators and the output is unstable, and that, what that means is, um, let's say you've got output, you've got 2,000 lines of code, and there's like 10 classes in this output. That's fine, um, but if every time the generator is rerun, the order of the contents changes, not the functionality, but the order of the contents, that will cascade to invalidate other things. So if there's any classes that refer to those, those classes are now victims of that change. And so basically, unstable generators cause a massive increase in the amount of work that has to be done. So um, you need to go through and wherever your generators are outputting content, make sure that the, the, the um, lists they're looping over have been sorted so that there's a stable order so the output's consistent when nothing has actually changed. So that you know, the amount of change in your input is roughly equivalent to the amount of change in your output for your generator. Um, and uh, another tip is, if you can leave super dev mode running for long periods of time, it's to your advantage, because every time you relaunch it, even with the 2.8 improvements that are coming, it, it costs you something in warm-up time. And this is something I, I tell internal users. And it's particularly painful um, if the work you're iterating on is at the RPC layer, then um, you end up needing to restart your backend server often, and then to synchronize the serialization changes, you may need to restart your super dev mode, and so you end up like, wiping out your hot cache over and over. And so maybe we can do something to make that better. Uh, we don't have specific plans there, but we know that's a problem. Um, so uh, I think Brian is gonna go into way more detail on, um, on debugger-oriented type information later in his talk, or have your, I don't know if you've already given your, given your talk. But basically, uh, I think the only place where we've regressed a little bit with the, the switch over to super dev mode and incremental compiles is Compared to um, dev mode, the debug experience is not, it's not as perfect, right? It's not Java running in Eclipse. Um, but there are a couple things you can do to, to try to ease that pain. Um, setting breakpoints in, in the Chrome inspector is a little bit painful. Instead, you can use the gwit.debugger line. It's kind of like the JavaScript debugger uh, line. It's just a way of telling the, the browser to freeze here. It's kind of nice. Um, you can also make sure you're using the latest version of Chrome. Brian has worked with the Chrome team identifying a lot of the performance bottlenecks they had on large output. So um, stepping through large files in the latest version of Chrome is a lot snappier than it used to be. There's also a number of crashes where uh, you may find this hard to believe. We've got some internal apps where the incremental output, because it's unoptimized, is over 100 megs. And that actually crossed a breakpoint with Chrome where the Chrome would just crash, it'd just be gone. <laughs> so anyways, that's fixed. You, you won't run into those sorts of problems. Um, and uh, we're also sort of pushing the Chrome team to take more advantage of source maps. So they use source mapping when they're displaying uh, code when you're stepping through in the debugger, but they're not really using the source map information in, in stack traces, and they're not using it in profiling. So once they do that, it'll make it possible for us to change how we output the source uh, for incremental compiles. Incremental compiles right now, we try to make it small because we need it to be fast, but we also um, try to leave the names readable because we can't trust that the browser is going to use the source map all the time. But if we didn't have to leave the name readable, we could obfuscate all the names even smaller, like 2x smaller, and so the output uh, would be smaller, the memory usage of super dev mode is smaller, um, the amount of time it takes for the browser to parse the output is shorter. So basically once uh, Chrome has better source map support, we'll be able to change 
uh, the naming standard we use for the output and get a performance boost. So hopefully that's coming in the next year or so. Um, uh, some of our m pretty immediate plans, this isn't really incremental compiler related, but more uh, compiler in general. Um, it's really important to us to finish Java 8, um, and it's really important to us to finish JSON TROP. So those are, that's what we're working on this quarter pretty much. And we expect to have Java 8 done, functionally done sometime this quarter. Um, so if you're, if you're working off of head rather than waiting for releases, you should have access to that within the next two months or so. Um, and, uh, and right after that comes JS interop work, which is a little bit foggier because the spec is still slightly changing, but it's, that's our immediate next priority after that. Um, lofty goals, and I'm not sure how many of these we will ever actually accomplish, but this is where we should be aiming. Um, we should expect to be f as fast as a regular Java compile. I'm sure everyone here uses you know, IntelliJ or Eclipse and regular Java. And um, I know that when I change a file and I, I run some console application, it's running like immediately. There's no waiting. And, and super dev mode gets us pretty close to that for medium sized applications, but there's still a performance differential there. And there's not really a good justification for why that performance differential is. It's largely an issue of age of the project and technical debt, and we're considering possible rewrites in some places. Um, uh, and then design-wise, we'd like to move the generators to the build system. Um, we do a pretty good job of detecting when generators need to be rerun, but a build system can do a much better job because it can force you to declare all the inputs and expected outputs and all that sort of thing. And it actually will have a, roughly a 50% a reduction in compile time effect, I believe, because one of the stages that's really expensive is the work we do to construct um, a type index specifically for generators. We do that once for the normal compile, like the optimization work, and once for the generators. And the way it's done for generators, because generators are promised this global type view of the world, uh, it's, a, it's very expensive. And we won't even need to do that anymore if the generators that you use are APT generators that are run in the build system. Um, someday we'd like to return to the idea of library-based compilation. It's a more elegant design. It uh, provides for, um, it provides for better caching in the build system layer. It provides for cache reuse across multiple people, potentially at the build system layer. It's things that, that uh, the compiler really isn't in the right place to be able to do. It also makes for a little bit saner development model. Um, so let's say that in your, uh, in your build system, you have targets defined where your application is working, but it only works because, you know, I've got some code on the left side of the tree that's using some class, but that code is not actually per registering the right dependency to, to get that class available. But it sort of works at the root because someone else somewhere in the tree has added that dependency. That's fine, but you're actually vulnerable to surprises. What can happen is if that person somewhere else in your dependency tree removes that dependency, your code suddenly breaks and you don't know why. If, if you had been forced to have all the, all the dependencies at all times, you're not sort of vulnerable to those surprises. So that's something to consider. Um, I mentioned this already, um, but we'd like to do something about this uh, permutation combinatorial explosion. Um, one of the ideas we're talking about is it would, um, most of these, most of the distinctions between permutations end up being something that uh, is a difference between browsers or something that could be detected at the browser level. So we'd like to output code that, um, that relies more on feature detection and locale detection. So we'd output one version of the application and that one version would have if statements that say, if this particular browser feature is available, then do it this way. If it's not available, then do it this way. So it's sort of a master copy that knows how to do everything across all browsers and then run it through a version of the compiler where you say, assume statically that a particular feature is on or a particular feature is not on. And that would allow us to statically rewrite that if statement to if false and then we could dead code strip the other branches. And that's how we could basically have one stage where you have a fast compile that's very simple and optionally, if you want to specialize for particular browsers or particular locales, it's not a, it's not a multiple compile stage, it's a specialization that's optional after the fact. Um, and it actually gives you a little bit more uh, control, I think, because you could, you could you know, have a list of all the features you care about and all the uh, locales you care about and you just sort of check off the exact way you want it. You could tweak it for it very, very precise circumstances or very general circumstances depending on what you want, uh, want at that time. We'd also like to switch over to output enclosure style JS. Um, I, I, to some degree, it's a little bit of a, a, a copy of ideas from TypeScript, but it's nice to have, it, have an intermediary format that's readable. You know, GWT code right now, our output 
it runs great, it's fast, it's small, all that sort of stuff, but it's not very readable, so if there was a problem to output, you wouldn't be able to track it down. Um, and so we'd like to have an intermediary format that's closure style JS, so you could examine that and get an understanding. It would fac also facilitate interaction between regular JavaScript libraries and this closure style code. And because the closure, um, the closure compiler optimizer is actually faster than ours, if our intermediary format was closure style JavaScript, <laughs> and we were relying on the closure compiler to do the optimizations of that, your optimized builds would actually be roughly 50% faster. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't be us like writing amazing new optimization work, that would be us reusing optimization work that's already been defined in another place, so it'd be a, a reduction in you know, total effort. And it'd allow us to, to sort of share work with the closure compiler team. Uh, potentially also resulting in smaller output eventually, although right now it's roughly the same. Um, so these are a little bit more crazy ideas. I don't know if we'll ever do some of this, but they're interesting. So um, there's a problem that happens with really, really large applications where um, let's say you have a million line application and you compile that for uh, Java and you run that on your desktop. The application still launches pretty fast because it doesn't load all those classes at the very beginning. It just loads the ones that are executing. It's sort of like the JVM is able to hook into the class loading process and the execution process and the moment a class is needed, it stops execution, it loads just that class and it continues. And that allows it to basically load the minimal set. And what we do with code splitting in the GWT compiler tries to do that statically, but it's not possible to do it statically as accurately as at runtime because you don't know the value of data. So like if some variable has a certain value, that affects whether or not other classes end up being loaded. We can't make assumptions about what those variable values are, so we have to do the conservative approach of loading more than is actually necessary. So if instead we were able to uh, get the browsers to provide some way to freeze the world, load something and continue, or we could exploit synchronous RPCs or something dirtier like that, depending on, you know, you know, play with the technology, prove it out, prove it's a good idea, um, and then maybe sell the idea to Chrome and Firefox and these people, we could potentially make it so that web application performance scales just as well as desktop application performance without things having to be super complex. It's, it's a relatively simple solution. Um, we also are playing around with ideas where uh, your application load wouldn't just be download the JavaScript and run it in the browser. It'd be more like download the JavaScript, store it in a local, uh, local cache, like a, a local storage or something, and then execute it. And then you could lazily update it in the background. Your user is running your application. It's got like a background thread to the server. If a new version becomes available, we could cache that locally. And the next time they refresh the browser, they're not having to wait on a download from the server for a new version. They've already got it in their local cache. Um, I'll also potentially maybe generalize what uh, super dev mode is doing for us performance wise. So um, part of the reason super dev mode is such a performance win versus just executing the compiler. And this is just part of it, but part of it is, um, is because it's warm, right? So when you're doing production compiles or test compiles, you're actually launching a compiler from scratch and now you have a fresh JVM process and that's not warm, it doesn't have caches warmed up, all sorts of things. What if we replace super dev mode or adapted super dev mode to be a, a general purpose compile server that was usable both for developer refreshes and for production compiles, you eliminate that cache warming period. So that's another one of our uh, little risky longer term ideas we may play with. Um, questions? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.